The World Cup has just ended. Are you still thinking about the games? Taking this opportunity, let's talk about topics related to soccer and geometry. Before going into any details, let's watch this demo. That's right. This is a 3D soccer ball drawn in plain text, with rotation and lighting effects added to boot. Isn't it cool? You may think that it must be very difficult to achieve. In fact, it only takes 80 lines of code. Welcome to CS with Terry. In this video, let's talk about how to draw a 3D soccer ball with plain text. You can too after watching it. The process of drawing a 3D soccer ball with plain text can be roughly divided into three steps. Step one, we want to build the model for the soccer ball. Step two, we need to project the 3D ball onto the two-dimensional screen. Step three, we need to add lighting effects to it. Let's start by looking at soccer ball modeling. We often see 3D spheres in games, but how does the computer render them? In fact, most of the computer rendered spheres we see are polyhedrons. When the facets of a polyhedron are continuously subdivided, the polyhedron can approximate a sphere. So how to build a polyhedron to approximate a sphere? There are many ways to do it, such as UV sphere, ICO sphere, quad sphere, and so on. You may ask, which sphere modeling method should we use to model a soccer ball? To answer this question, we need to take a closer look at its geometry. By observation, we can find that a soccer ball is composed of 32 pieces, including 12 black pieces, which are pentagons, and 20 white pieces, which are hexagons. If we compress the black pieces into points and stretch the white pieces into triangles, the soccer ball becomes an icosahedron. In other words, the geometric shape of the soccer ball is derived from the icosahedron. Therefore, we should choose the icosphere method to model the soccer ball. Let's take a closer look at the process. First of all, we need to define the regular icosahedron, and their vertex coordinates can be described like this. Next, for each triangle inside, we can subdivide it into four triangles, like this. Finally, we project the vertices of the subdivided triangles onto the surface of the sphere. In other words, we scale the vectors from the center of the sphere to the vertices to be equal to the radius of the sphere. Do this for all the other triangles as well. This is how one round of subdivision is completed. Through the same operation, we can complete the second round, the third round, and so on. As the number of subdivision rounds increases, the polyhedron gets closer and closer to a sphere. This is the icosphere method. After modeling the sphere, how to color it into a soccer ball? We can see that this icosphere has 12 very special vertices, which are the 12 vertices of the original icosahedron. Let's call them key vertices. If you take these key vertices as the center, expand evenly to the surroundings, and color the reached triangles, you can see this effect. It basically has taken the shape of a soccer ball. How far should we extend from these 12 key vertices? If we expand too little, it looks like this, and if we expand too much, it does not look good either. One way to achieve better visual effect is that we connect two key vertices along the spherical surface and divide the resulting arc into three equal parts. By expanding the key vertex to around one-third of the aforementioned arc, we can achieve the best visual effect. Let's implement the soccer ball model in Python. We can import the TriMesh library to implement the icosphere method, just like this. Not only that, we can also pass in the number of subdivisions as a parameter. Setting it to zero, we get an icosahedron without subdivision. Setting it to a larger number, we can get a finer sphere. Next, let's color the soccer ball in black and white. In the previous explanation, we colored each triangle black. Here, we simplify it and color each vertex. As mentioned before, we will expand evenly around the key vertex and color the expanded areas black. It can be implemented with code like this. We can perform breadth-first traversal starting from the key vertex and color the traversed points black. How many steps of traversal do we need to perform? 
As explained before, we need to expand the black areas to around one third of the R connecting two key vertices, which consists of multiple smaller segments. But how many segments are there? Let's try to derive it. When there is no subdivision, there is one segment. With one subdivision, there are two segments. With two subdivisions, there are four segments, and so on. Therefore, the number of segments on this arc is equal to 2 to the power of subdivision number. Let's denote it as key point distance. This completes the coloring process. Let's visualize it. The result looks pretty good, but there are some flaws. The seams between the white pieces are not colored. We can modify the code like this. We calculate the shortest path between two vertices. If the length of the shortest path happens to be equal to the key point distance, we'll color the path black, like this. So far, we have completed the modeling of the soccer ball. Next, let's take a look at how to project a 3D object onto a 2D plane. The three-dimensional objects we usually see on the screen are actually their projections on a two-dimensional plane, because all our screens are two-dimensional. How do we do it then? We can first establish a three-dimensional coordinate system. Let the origin be the center of the screen, and let the x-axis be the horizontal line pointing to the right, y-axis be the vertical line pointing down, and z-axis be the line perpendicular to the screen pointing inward. We assume our eyes are in front of the screen with coordinates 0, 0, minus k. The so-called perspective projection is projecting a point in 3D space onto the screen along a straight line. To do this, we can connect a line between this point and the eye. The intersection of this line and the screen is the projected point on the 2D plane. So how to find x prime and y prime? We can derive it by using the property of similar triangles, just like this. This is how we can obtain the formula for calculating the projected points on the screen. Let's implement it in code. First, we define the output variable, which is a two-dimensional character array with shape screen size by screen size. We'll use it to display the final projected image. Then, we define a function draw points, which can project 3D points onto a 2D screen. Here, we need to perform a simple coordinate transformation. Previously, we defined the center of the screen as the origin. However, in a two-dimensional array output, the upper left corner is the origin. So x and y need to be shifted. After the three-dimensional point is projected and coordinate transformed, we record its characters on the output, just like this. We need to be mindful of another detail here. When we project the sphere, we need to omit the occluded points, because we cannot see them. Let's connect a point on the sphere to the eye to form a vector. If the angle between this vector and the normal vector of this point is an acute angle, it means that this point is in the visible area. If it is an obtuse angle, it means that this point is in the occlusion area. Therefore, we can perform a dot product operation on the two vectors, and if the result is negative, the point will be masked out. Next, we call the draw points function to draw white and black points respectively. Here, we offset the points of the sphere along the z direction for a better display. Let's execute the program, and we can see that the soccer ball has been shown. In addition, we can slightly modify the code so that it rotates around the y-axis, and we see a rotating soccer ball. Although this looks pretty good, you may notice that this is not exactly the same as the demo we showed at the beginning of the video. The difference is caused by lighting. To further improve the result, we need to represent the brighter parts with heavier characters and the darker parts with lighter characters. Let's see how it's done. For the sake of simplicity, 
we only consider diffuse reflection and do not consider specular reflection. Imagine the sun is shining from above, then the ground would be very bright. As the sun sets, the ground will slowly get darker. Is there a way we can use mathematics to describe the intensity of light on the ground? First, we need to draw the normal vector of the ground, which is a vector pointing upward, denoted as n. Then, we use L to represent the direction pointing to the light source. This is the opposite of the vector of a light beam. The smaller the angle between L and N, the brighter the ground looks, and vice versa. When the angle exceeds 90 degrees, there will be no light shining on the ground. Thus, the brightness of the ground is proportional to the cosine of this angle. This formula is called the Lambert's cosine law. Of course, Lambert's cosine law applies to more than just flat surfaces. In fact, each point on our sphere has its own normal vector, so lighting effects can also be added to it. Let's implement the code for adding lighting effects. First, we define a vector L, which points to the direction of the light source. In other words, it is the opposite of the vector of a light beam. We calculate the cosine of the angle between the normal vector and L for each point on the sphere. Since both vectors are unit vectors, we can simply perform the dot product. When the cosine value is less than zero, it means that there is no light, we can just set it to zero. Next, we define a character array representing the characters displayed under different lighting conditions. As we mentioned just now, the larger the cosine value, the stronger the light, and the characters towards the end of the character list should be used. Let's run the program. As you can see, lighting has been added to the soccer ball. Finally, we have successfully drawn a rotating 3D soccer ball with plain text. The Python code is included in the video description. If you are interested, please feel free to check it out and run it by yourself. Before we end today's video, I'll leave you with a question. Today we have drawn a spinning soccer ball with text. How to draw a spinning donut with text? You can refer to the article linked in the video description. That's all for today. If you like our videos, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share it with your friend. If you have any suggestions, please leave a comment. Thank you and see you next time.